Hi, this is Ed. Hi, I'm Hugh. Welcome to Tone Twins TV and our episode, our long-awaited episode, on the Gibson ES330. Welcome back, everybody. It's been a strange few months, yeah. but we're back in the Tone Twins lair, so... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we've been wanting to do this video for absolutely ages. Um, I'm a 330 fan. Uh, I've got a couple myself, and... We've basically just been waiting to have a long neck example, one of the late 60s ones, so we could actually compare it with the two earlier ones. And courtesy of ATV Guitars in Cheltenham, our friends up there, uh, we have this beautiful cherry red example. We do, which the eagle-eyed amongst you will have already spotted seems to sprout this what we call yeah the longer neck the neck isn't longer at all <laughs> no. it's not a baritone or anything is it but it's... no the, the necks are the same the, the, the scale neck uh, length is the same but the fundamental difference between uh, that guitar and these two guitars is that uh, prior to 1968 um, the neck joint was actually made at the 16th fret and it was moved to the 19th fret. So yep. bringing this one basically in line with the uh, 335. And improving, I guess, perhaps a concern from players in terms of access, you know, reaching those higher frets. Yeah. This guitar actually took over from the ES225 as Gibson's premier fully hollow P90 loaded um, electric guitar. Yeah. And um, they phased that out in 59, which is the same year that this guitar uh, was introduced. and. My feeling is that it was the Ted McCarty era and they were bringing out the, the Burst, the Flying V, the Explorer, yeah. you know, the 335 had, had, had come out in, in 58. Yeah, I'd imagine it's fundamentally, I mean, when sort of McCarty and the team developed that, I mean, that gorgeous 335 outline, as we know, it kind of makes sense to think, you know, we'll, we'll revamp some of the range and include that where possible, because, I mean, why wouldn't you? <laughs> exactly, but at the same time, what, what, what seems to have happened over the years is that there's been this confusion about these guitars, and a lot of people regard them as being like the, the poor man's uh, 335 or the budget mm. 335, and they're entirely different guitars, be primarily because... These are completely hollow, there's no centre block, and also they're equipped with P90 pickups rather than humbuckers. Yeah. The outline is the confusing thing, because they initially at a glance look so much like a 335, yeah. like you say, because they don't do a lot of what a 335 does well. When you compare them in that terms, they can appear to be weaker, but in fact they do a lot of other things perhaps better than a 335. Exactly. And different guitars. Yeah, and it's, it's one reason we're not actually going to be doing a 335 versus 330 co comparison because, mm. you know, essentially it would be, be tantamount to comparing, you know, a Strat against a Telecaster. They're just different guitars. I mean, what's the point? Yeah, exactly. But so, so outline aside, um, Gibson sort of moved on in 58 to include those. There was the models. We don't have one today, but they did the similar thing to the 225 where you had a single pickup T model, so a 330T. Yeah. And then these are all um, TD twin double or, or exactly. know, double models, double pickups, which mirrored the 225 range. Yeah, yeah, and the really irritating thing that they did, just like the 225s, <laughs> like, this is a bugbear of mine. Uh, you've I, got a 225 with one pickup, yeah, 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 so you yeah, disagree yeah. with me. Yeah. But uh, they put the pickup bang slap in the middle, which really, it's kind of annoying because it stops you upgrading your, your 225 or your 330 single pickup version to a double one. I guess un I'd come un from it. Unlike the Gretsch Anniversary and the True. Tennessean. I, I like the single pickup ones, but ultimately they're nowhere near as versatile, obviously, as for double pickup models. So let's have a whisk through the how the features changed over the years. So this... Uh, the 330 was basically in Gibson's catalogue from 59 mm -hmm. through to 72. And like the 335, the early ones had, the very early ones had the chunkier necks and they had the dot markers. And by 1960, most of the necks had gone really, really skinny. Yeah. Uh, the other thing to look out for, until the end of 62, they had these black plastic pickup covers. Yeah. And then they changed to the metal covers. But the early metal covers and all the hardware was nickel plated. And then around about 1965, they changed to chrome plating for all the hardware and the covers. So the move to chrome hardware was a logical one at the time. It stays mm. shinier and brighter for ages. Absolutely. Um, perhaps worth mirroring as well or mentioning at this time, the close cousin to the Gibson 330, which is the Epiphone Casino, mm -hmm. which... Um, obviously become famous use by the Beatles and the Stones and so on. Lots of the changes that happened on the Gibson models 
were mirrored on the casino. Another change you might notice, um, if you look carefully at the 62 and you compare it with the 68 and the 65, is that these ears are a different shape. Again, this is exactly the same as the 335. So this has what's called the Mickey Mouse ears, they're more rounded and they subsequently became more pointed. But you spotted something earlier on that I'd never spotted in terms of the, the cutaways here. Yeah, we were just having a good look over the guitars as we do and it sort of we I said to Hugh, well let's let's do some measurements because I was noticing this this sort of distance here compared to the sixty two, which uh you know quite similar. Obviously the sixty eight vastly different, you know, mm -hmm. because of the different neck join that we've mentioned. Mm -hmm. But those two I thought they look very different. This length, you know, we measured it from where the pickup is mm -hmm. and then this gap. And yeah, it was quite different, wasn't this, it? This one looks like it's deeper set into the body, and it, mm. and it, it, it is, um, not in terms of where the neck joint is made, but in terms of the the lowest point here in the cutaway, down to, if you measure it to the, the, the fixing screw on the P90, uh, it's almost half an inch difference, yeah. which means you can actually reach higher up the neck. It's a real noticeable feel change, Yeah, it's about two it? frets. Yeah. They're not so much lead guitars with huge sustain like Les Pauls and so on, but it was obviously something Gibson were conscious of mm. because they made this guitar. One other change to point out as well is that the later models had uh, nylon saddles and the earlier models had the brass saddles in the ABR1 bridges. Uh, and again, this makes a, a difference in tone. Good. You could argue that the, uh, the metal covers make a difference because they introduce a capacitance that actually rolls off the top end. So they sound, these ones sound a little bit warmer and these ones are a little bit more um, cutting, brighter, maybe a little bit more percussive in tone. This one actually has a mix of saddles. That's not original in terms of, they should all be the nylon saddles on this oh, guitar. One, yeah. We have found that metal saddles perhaps have a bit more biting top end and the, mm -hmm. the nylon saddles are a touch warmer, yeah. touch growlier in the mid-range perhaps. Exactly. So let's have a listen to these acoustically. And uh, there, there are vast differences between all three of these. Uh, so we'll have a quick listen to those and then we'll come back with some more information about 330s. <laughs> So really interesting that outwardly so similar guitars mm -hmm. constructed the same way. They're all sort of well, they five ply maple mm -hmm. bodies mm -hmm. and sides, mm -hmm. tops, um, rosewood neck, mm -hmm. um, mahogany neck. Sorry, with a rosewood fingerboard. Yeah, very similarly constructed, yet quite vast differences in sound. Yeah, I would say so. This is both brighter and quieter than the other two. I would say. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's quite a lively one as well. It's really kind of quick uh, transients on it. It's a bit, it's a bit growlier and alive and awake. Almost feels it's a bit more on the edge all the time. It's not as yeah. constrained as some of the, this. This one in particular is quite produced and very very, very polite almost, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think that one's much smoother and more mm. compressed in its response. It's a, it's actually easier to play. Um, if if your technique is a bit wayward, like, like certain like people, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, it's actually qu quite difficult to play this one if you're trying to do like chord melody type stuff. Uh, this one, on the other hand, makes life really easy for you. Bit of compression in the tone yeah. and everything just sits together nicely. Yeah. Um, but what about this one? 
that's sort of somewhere in between, I'd say. Um, I think, a bit I honkier. It's, it's, yeah, it's got yeah. a real honky kind of mid-range to it, isn't it? It's quite a warm tone to it. Yeah. It's really clear, but it's got mm. a pronounced kind of honkiness in the mid-range. I, I really like I mean, I like them all for different reasons. Mm. But, yeah, this one could be um, sort of the the pickups. It could be the the sunburst finish in terms of it. It does put me in that Beatles frame of mind. It's got that honky, growly mid-range. Again, there's a million reasons why I associate that with those sort of rubber sole revolver era 66 Beatles where they started to really use these they had those Vox amps with a load of mid-range in and the way they were recording and stuff so it's unfair to really ascribe that to this guitar but it does put me in that mind there's not mm. as much sparkly top mm. end perhaps as those pickups um yeah just a bit, bit sort of honkier guitar but but great really nice yeah as we've alluded to, the 330 is often regarded as the budget 335. Um, and they they seem to be really popular in the early part of the 60s. And then they gradually lost popularity. And it's kind of understandable in a sense because, you know, it was the era of blues rock and psychedelia. And people were looking for and volume, over <laughs> volume, overdriven <laughs> tones and sustain. Yeah. And um, these guitars do not sustain particularly well, certainly in comparison to a 335. Uh, and the other thing they, they, they don't really like very much is, is high volume. They will feed back so, so quickly. They really do. And if you think of the era, the late 60s, when bands who were playing out often weren't using a PA, all their stage volume was coming from these massive Marshall stacks. About You think of the classic mm -hmm. Cream at the Royal Albert Hall, a couple of twin Marshall stacks. You know, you introduce one of these guitars to a cranked up tweed deluxe at 12 watts and you can't really control it no absolutely you know, not let alone a couple of hundred watts worth of martial power you know so i guess they kind of they were kind of more popular with rhythm guitar players um glenn frey from the eagles played one for for donkey's years because they've naturally got a quicker sort of decay to the mm -hmm. note not so much sustain mm -hmm. they're perfectly suited for rhythm type stuff yeah Perhaps you don't want the rhythm to completely wash out you know you want nice percussive fitting in with the drums and mm -hmm. the bass and so on and and as the Beatles have shown with their casinos you know mm. they certainly fit parts of all sorts of styles but certainly rhythm mm. John Lennon famously it's probably his most used guitar um didn't sound too bad so <laughs> <laughs> yeah they did all right actually they did all right as a yeah. four boys from Liverpool they did all right I think as well like bringing it really up to date is that these three thrills have become really quite popular again I mean I started noticing it in the 80s um and people like Lloyd Cole and the Commotions mm -hmm. and of course the Jesus and Mary chain uh William Reed played one of these yeah. and you know it would became you know as we said these things become uncontrollable and feedback like crazy at high, high volume which is probably exactly what he wanted it to do so it's just like an onslaught of white noise with a fuzz box so they're great for that but also in this day and age you know there are volume restrictions when we play live and in a sense they've become almost like the ideal guitar now because yeah. the, the volume uh, limitations that previously existed, it's not so much of an issue anymore. Completely, and the approach to tone nowadays is different. You know, it used to be you wanted overdrive, you had to turn your amp up loud. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nowadays, there's such a plethora of overdrive pedals. You can get your tone and your sustain and to make up for yeah. the perceived um, issues with these I don't really think they are issues you just mm. have to trust the guitar for what it does yeah. or accept it for what it does mm. but you can make up for that nowadays so in terms of studio recording playing you know um, sort of live stuff like I say at lower mm -hmm. volumes they can mm. be really great guitars yeah exactly the other thing you'll notice with this one is it's been retrofitted with a Bigsby and this is an ancient Bigsby it was on the guitar when I bought it and um, I think it's quite a popular mod. Uh, I know um, Barry Cadogan uh, has one, I think it's the same year as this one, and he's put I a Bigsby so. on his, same colour and everything. Uh, and it's, it's cool with a Bigsby, I like it. They're, they're, I think this style and shape of guitar, they just look cooler and they sound better with a Bigsby. Yeah, I mean, these tra yeah. trapeze tail pieces are the, the kind of standard issue. But uh, yeah, I think Bigsby is an acceptable mod. The other thing we should notice about this guitar... Um, as you move up the neck, it seems you know pretty much the same as the other two guitars, but down here it's almost two millimeters narrower, uh, which doesn't yeah, sound like a lot, but when you're actually playing it, it feels really quite different. Yeah, the, you notice that in those sort of late late sort of sixties Gibsons, don't you? It gets mm -hmm. 
But again, it's, it shouldn't be something to massively put you off the guitar. Perhaps you soon seem to get used to it. I do anyway. Is one better than the other? Personal choice, isn't it? Exactly. You know? It's worth noting that the ergonomics of this guitar in particular, with the sort of 19th fret join to the body and the, the narrower nut, it's a very different feel. Those two you pick up, they're almost interchangeable. You know, you, you could be mm -hmm. blindfolded and not really know the difference. Perhaps the Bigsby would be the giveaway. Mm -hmm. um, but this one's a different feel. It's almost Firebird-esque in that the neck feels out there when you're playing it. But you only know, after you've been playing one of these. I mean, it's, it's weird. It's a bit like uh, when you change from a regular acoustic to a 12-fret acoustic, 12 frets to the body. It's just everything's a little bit more compact. Yeah. And you get used to it quite quickly and it actually starts to feel really comfortable and it, it's a really nice playing experience. Definitely. Anyway, shall we let, let's cut to um, a bit of playing and we're just going to have a listen to what these three guitars, uh, how these three guitars sound, uh, doing a little bit of chord melody stuff through a clean box AC-10. So how did they sort of feel and what was the sound differences to you then? Uh, I spent a while picking an amp um, and they, they, these guitars work really, really well, I think, with a Vox for, for clean tones and semi-driven tones. It's just mm -hmm. a match made in heaven for me. Um, to be honest, I've, this one is a real handful to, to play clean and to do really precise stuff. It, it, it was quite tricky to do. Yeah. This one's a little bit more forgiving and this was the easiest of the lot. Um, this one I felt had a little less low end, um, but it had more sparkle than the other two. Uh, this one was perhaps the most balanced of the lot. And this one, smoother, but perhaps a little muted. That one's definitely alive on the edge, isn't it? That guitar, it's... Yeah, uh, this is, uh, I think yeah. these two are more exciting to play than that one. On the other hand, that one might be a lot easier to live with. Definitely, and, and I've got to say, there's something I really like about this neck profile. Um, mm. You know, the 62's quite a thin neck. Um, it chunks out a little bit by this, by the 64, 65. Yeah, era. this is my favourite um, neck. Yeah. But I, of I, the three. I, I really like this as well, actually, the way it sort of fits. It's a nice yeah, guitar. I mean, they're all nice. lovely guitars and yeah. they do a lot of things really well, so... 
Well, we've heard these three guitars clean, and I think it's probably time to just give it a little bit of uh, goose the amp a little bit and hear what they sound like with a bit of overdrive. Yeah, so uh, hope you enjoy. Thank you. 
I say I'd enjoyed that. Um, Cheers. I, you, you're not that familiar with these models, I know. So how did that feel to you to, to play with Overdrive? Feels great. I mean, they, you know, they, they excel at doing the cleaner stuff, but I think they really take drive well. Um, they feel familiar-ish in terms of their Gibsons, and they've got they all have a great similarity in lots of ways. This one felt tighter, a mm-hmm. um, bit, bit more difficult to play in some ways, but then again, it has a nice sort of ring to it. The one with the big speed, perhaps a little bit more rubbery under the fingers. Um, the frets can have a huge difference as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. Um, overall, no surprise they've been used on countless records, really, because they mm-hmm. seem to record really well and mm-hmm. make some lovely sounds. Um, no, thoroughly enjoyed it. So, Hugh, the big question then. Out of the three, which one would you go for? Well, I'm spot in a sense because I own two of them already. <laughs> Just um, three. I have a mixed relationship with 330s, to be perfectly honest. I mean, I bought my first one back in the 80s for £200, and it was immaculate, it was a 65, and I always regretted selling it. And then this one came up, and I bought this back in maybe 2001, 2002. Um, And it's one of the the guitars that I I play least, but often I'm in a recording situation, whether it's myself or with a band, and... We're trying to find a tone that works and we go through all the guitars that are available and this thing invariably wins it's just just sits in tracks really well it's got some really characterful tones yeah. i do like it i struggle with the fact that it doesn't sustain as much because you know i always default to that boring kind of bluesy rock nonsense that <laughs> so many of us do and i struggle with the sustain um but it's just brilliant for for chordal type stuff and yeah, for parts uh, and for and, rhythm yeah, yeah. and I think I would go with this one it's simply because I love the way it looks for a start I think it's just mm. a fantastic looking guitar I love the Bigsby uh, I struggle with the thin neck but that's not too much of an issue but there's something about this guitar that's just a little bit wilder and more percussive and exciting to play. This one I find kind of mellow, um, sweet, really, really nice, sustains better as well. Um, but it doesn't excite me as much. And this one, um, like it, it, I'd compare it to this one, but even more so. It's just really smooth, really compressed, great upper fret access. I love it, but... It kind of, that one really is closer to a 335, and for a pure 330 experience, I go for the 62. I think you've hit the nail on the head in terms of you've been describing the things it does well rather than it doesn't. And if you approach these guitars hoping it will be a 335 or be able to do Les Paul esque sustain or a 335 esque sustain, you'll come away disappointed. But if you play the stuff that it does well, like you say, a bit more percussive things. Um, things which sit really well in a mix of mm. arpeggios, mm-hmm. little parts. The character of the guitar shines through far more, perhaps, than a brute force of a humbucker equipped solid body or, or semi solid uh, 335. Um, so they do lots of things really well, which I think is important to, to, to note with guitars in general. Go with what the guitar does rather than what you hope it does, perhaps. Yeah, um, great advice. They, they certainly work different ways. Surprisingly for me, I'm starting to veer towards this one almost as a great studio tool. The, the added fret access could be super useful. The compression and the way it would just it balance would sit in a track mm-hmm. without any difficulties, easier to play. Um, mm-hmm. They're all fantastic. It's, it's a toss-up for me actually between these two. Um, the huge Beatles fan in me even though it's not a Beatles guitar, veers towards this era of guitar. You like, like the say, Beatles? Yeah, I've never that. Yeah, Beatles. yeah. All I do is go on about the Beatles all the time. So overall, I'd be happy with all of them. They all do different yeah. things really well. Yeah. A Bigsby on one of these would be great. Um, yeah, spoiled for choice. Happy to choose any. Well, thanks for watching. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And another really big thanks to ATB Guitars in Cheltenham for letting us uh, borrow this guitar. Hope you all subscribe. We've got a bunch more content coming soon. So hopefully see you all then. Diolch Dabo.